Well, and then you go from being Dennis Lehane person, writer, yeah, to... Yeah, suddenly your name's in block. Right, and I've been told nobody ever responds to you quite the same way after that, that didn't know you before. Not quite true. That's not quite true. But you get into these weird things where you right. certainly, a perception grew up very quickly in the mystery world that I thought I was beyond the mystery world. And that was something that I tried very hard to change and then realized it was a losing battle, that there were just people who would just say terrible things about me. It didn't matter what I did. And I remember thinking, that sucks. Right. You know, that really sucks. I finally had a conversation with Laura Lippman and she just said, yeah, you can't win this one. You just, there's no winning. There's no, there's just no way. You have a target on your back is never coming off. And that's when I sort of said, well, then I'm just not playing anymore. I'm just not, not right. going to play the game. I've still made some really good friends since then. I think it helps that I always stayed within the sort of world that I was always comfortable with anyway. My friends are still my friends. I just didn't go through that thing that I think a lot of people right. with, you know, who are my friends kind of vibe. You know what I mean? I didn't have much of that. I had a couple. My wife goes through it more than I go through it. My wife has people who come up to her. She's now getting more and more wary because it's like, are, are they trying to be my friend or are they trying to get to my husband? Right. That sucks. I've always thought though, if you're going to choose a kind of celebrity, this is the best. This is the best. The best. Because in the grocery store, no one's... The vast majority of people do not recognize you. Right. I get recognized in Boston occasionally, but, um, but people don't bother you either. If you pay to be part of the dance, then the dance can ultimately own you. If you don't pay, then you don't have to play. And that's the way the media will treat you too. People will say to me, you know, how did you escape this? How did you go through an extremely messy personal time? And nobody wrote about it. And it's like, because I've never called them. Right. You never call me, but I'll always answer your call. If you call me, I'll answer your phone call. But you're not searching for it. I will never call you. I will never call you and say, look, I got a book coming out in November. Could you help me pimp it? If I were to go out and run over a family of four, then yeah, I'm okay. I'm, I'm in the press. But beyond that, I think most people say, hey, he didn't pay for the dance, so leave him alone. With the exception of Shutter Island and Coronado, mm -hmm. Boston is a character yeah, in, in your work. Yeah, it's my town. Did you... Was that on purpose to so sort of strongly place identify? It's just something I always did. I would play sort of writers from Tulip because I'd write all over the place. I was obviously in Coronado story set in the South. But I noticed from a very early age as a student that the things that people really responded to were the things I wrote that were set in the neighborhood. Right. I grew up. And I went, well, that's, I'm lucky enough to come from a place that's that unique. I should probably mind that. And then as time went on, I just grew more and more deeply in love with the idea of just writing about this city for the rest of my life. I did my Coronado, that was fun. I don't see probably ever doing that again. I never say never, because I you know, didn't think I'd ever bring Patrick and Andrew back. But right, I'm glad you did. I just, I don't see the point. I grew up in this wonderful, very, very unique place that I understand. You have to grow up there since you're really small to really understand that city. It's the one thing, almost the only time I bristle in any, you want to call me a crime novelist, I don't give a shit. You want to call me a mystery writer, I don't care. The only time I bristle in anything is when I hear somebody else refer to it as the Boston novelist. Well, but then your screenwriting for The Wire is yep. so strongly identified with Baltimore. All we had to do, me, Richard, George Pelicanos, he's from, he's from DC, he's not from Baltimore, there's a big difference, and Richard's from New York. Richard Price. What we had to do was just do our thing. And then David and Ed took it and they put in the, the correct names of the streets and they, you know what I mean? They did all that shit. We didn't have right. to do it. I didn't know where Pimlico was. I didn't know the difference between East and West Baltimore. You know, they took care of that. What we were asked to bring to the table was our understanding of the urban machine. Right. Which I think we all kind of grasped. What was that experience like? It was great. It was awesome. Yeah, was, right? Yeah. When you're the novelist, you're like, you're the general contractor. You take care of everything. When you write an episode of TV, you're just the guy who comes in and paints a room. It's great. They have the contracts. You don't have to worry about shit. You just show up. It's, it's awesome. It's very um, freeing, I would think. Very freeing, and you also know you're working for something that's extremely high quality. So The Given Day is also kind of a departure for you, being as it is a historical novel with huge overarching themes of race identification, the American dream, corruption, the emergence of the early Boston Union movement. I understand this was planned as a trilogy. Mm. So what can you tell me about what we might expect from these books? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I sort of know where the next one's going, but I need to wait some things out. I have some other projects in, in, in front of it, and it needs just a little more gestation time. I can't tell you how I know it, but I always knew it. I mean, I got the idea from Mystic River six years before I wrote the book, you know. The next book is going to be my gangster book. I know that. I want to write a gangster book. My absolute greatest love in the arts is gangster movies. Really? Which one? I love gangster Do you have a favorite? 
Oh no, I got Father Part Two. So I'm doing my. That's next. It's not a sequel to The Giving Day, but it's part. It's connected. Have connected. you always written? Yeah, I was eight till about sixteen. I just overwrote for myself. And then I was 16, I had this great priest in my high school. He taught my um, American League class junior year, and he was the one who really inspired me to write and understand what writing was. And then four years later, I dropped out of two colleges, and I said, well, I should probably now really take this seriously because I'm not good at anything else, and that's when I committed. What was the time frame between that and right before the war coming out? Well, uh, eight years. Eight years. I'm a big believer in 10,000 hours. Ten years, 10,000 hours. Oh, that is depressing. I know. So it was eight years of publication, but I completed my next book ten years almost to the day of when I decided to become a writer. And that's when I felt I knew what I was doing. It's not the first book, I mean, second novels, where you find out if you're a novelist. You right. know what I mean? So, because everybody can write the story of their life once. Do you feel like you rediscover that when you take a left turn, like, for example, going from the Patrick and Angie series to Mystic, Mystic River, or then to The Given Day? Do you rediscover yourself as a novelist when yeah. you make a change? You rediscover yourself, you also challenge yourself, you also discover, are you capable of writing outside genre? Are you capable of taking a whole new genre on? I'd always wanted to do a gothic. I love gothic. I absolutely love like Mary Shelley and the Bronte sisters. And this, this writer now, Patrick McGrath, um, who right. I just adore. So one day I said, you know, what the hell? You know? <laughs> and whatever I follow Mystic River with is going to be, well, it's good, but it's no Mystic River at best. So. Shit, man, do you gothic now? You know, and yeah, so that I wrote Shut Around. I just think it's not worth doing unless on some level it scares the shit out of you. And that was Moonlight Mop. Can I go back to a series 11 years after I left it? Yikes. Was it hard to get back in the water? Yikes. It's terrifying. Right, because they've aged. They've aged. When you first start doing it, it's like, oh, it's like putting on my old pair of favorite jeans, you know? And then gradually you write a little bit and you go, oh, huh, I forgot. I don't fit in those jeans anymore. I went up a couple of belt sizes. And they're also out of fashion. It was a different type of journey and it was scary in its own way because a lot of people are like, oh, you've written an actual classic pedestrian mystery. You know, I can already feel that vibe coming at me after the given day. And it's like, Oof. yeah, coming off the given day, that was exactly the most terrifying thing I could think to do. Right, it's a completely different book, yeah. Completely different. Yeah. Well, so is Patrick still talking to you? A little bit, yeah. So we might have a little more? I don't know. I mean, everybody says, everybody keeps saying, my mother-in-law said she was just completely depressed when she came up with my mom. She said, it's the end of them. You know, I'll never see him again. And I was like, yeah, it does feel like that. But I don't know. We'll see. I don't know. I guess we'll have to leave it with that. Dennis Lehane, thank you very much for giving me your time today. And oh, enjoy Ragdale. Oh, thanks a lot. Thank you. That was easy.